Okay, so when we talk about spinal cord injury, we are talking about what we as respiratory therapists are responsible for, for as far as spinal cord injury. And we do have a lab that we will be doing on spinal cord injury. So let's go on to our next slide here. Um, we're gonna talk about our various spinal cord injuries. Um, when we talk about spinal cord in injuries, we're talking about the level of the injury, which means where on the spinal column the patient is injured. Um, we're gonna differentiate those areas of injuries and what that means in terms of patient mobility, how much the patient can move. And then we're gonna talk about immobilization and C-spine precautions. This is what you see at the scene of an accident. They will put the C-collar on the patient and they will not be cleared till some time after they've been in the emergency room and we have cleared them via x-ray. And then we need to understand our responsibilities of, um, with spinal cord injury, with um, manual resuscitation. This is when we use our jaw thrust maneuver and um, what our responsibilities there at the head of the bed are. Okay, so what is the problem with spinal cord injuries? Well, the big problem is they disrupt the protection of the spinal cord. Um, the spinal cord itself is surrounded with fluid and if it gets even pinched, even a millimeter, then that can cause the disruption of those messages coming from the brain going to the muscles, telling the muscles what to do. Obviously, if it's permanent, it could be permanently um, damaged and that would cause paralysis. And the reason the paralysis is at different levels is it's because it's those message muscles and or messages that are further along on the path that will never receive the message once that spinal cord's injured. And we'll go into more detail about this in a minute. More often than not, this results from trauma, some kind of accident, some kind of um, fall, something very traumatic. And the reason we really, really care about spinal cord injuries is when I said a minute ago, it could be as little as one millimeter, that is a tiny, tiny bit of movement. So they can be easily under o overlooked. You know, they could, people could assume because it's not grossly crazy, you can't see the patient's neck turned wrong or um, you can't see the, the discs um, displaced that, oh, it must not be a spinal cord injury. That is not the case it can be easily overlooked and we can only rule out spinal cord injuries with imaging. Um, our big problem children, if you will, are gonna be our 15, 25 year old males and that's because they did something crazy. I was in a neuro ICU one day on a Sunday when I was a fairly new respiratory therapist and I looked around at my patients. I had five patients who were males in this age range, one of them might've been like 26 or 27. I think all of them were over 18, but this was in Southern California. And all of these young men had been fine Wednesday or Thursday of the week of that week before, because this was a Sunday afternoon. So I had five permanently paralyzed patients on mechanical ventilation, they all may not have stayed permanently paralyzed on mechanical ventilation forever. They all probably stayed paralyzed, but it's the level of injury that requires mechanical ventilation. But their injuries were things like jumping off um, a roof into a pool, diving into the ocean where that shallow water comes up and that sand catches your neck and breaks it. Another one was a motorcycle accident, another one a mountain bike accident and one was in a motor vehicle accident. So it can happen and it can happen often and it is usually these younger males because they're doing a lot of extreme sports or crazy things, things you would see on some MTV show. And it can result in spinal cord injury and permanent paralysis, FYI people. Traffic accidents are the most frequent cause though. Okay, so let's go into some anatomy. Um, we have 24 vertebrae in our spine, and between each of those vertebrae lie a disc. 
They are tied together by ligaments, and this permits a limited range of motion. We actually have quite a bit of range of motion. The only thing we can't really do is go um, extension backwards kind of crazily. And then as obviously as the older we get, the less our flexibility gets. But lateral flexion, we have quite a bit of. And um, rotation, we're able to turn quite a bit. Um, pay attention to here. Notice our spiny processes are on the outside, on the outside of the spine. That's why if you feel your own back, you will feel your spiny processes. Okay. So let's go into the anatomy of the spine a little bit. Um, we do need to know for this class and all the exams how many of each section of vertebrae there are. So let's go into that, shall we? There are three major sections, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. Um, below the lumbar is the sacrum, and we'll show you that in a minute. And this is our, our numbers. We have seven cervical, 12 thoracic, and five lumbar. BLD here stands for breakfast, lunch, dinner. When you think about the times of traditional meals, 7 a.m. would be breakfast. That's going to be your first seven cervical vertebrae, 12 is um, lunch, thoracic, 12 um, thoracic vertebrae, and five is at the bottom, lumbar, and that would be the dinner hour. So that's just a little way to remember that. And again, you do need to know that for all the exams. Okay, so the spinal canal sits in the center and it, surround, um, and it surrounds and protects the spinal cords and the nerves. We're gonna see that in the picture here in a second. The spinal dura is an extension of the dura matter of the brain and it's a, it's a think membrane. This is actually telling um, the membrane what to do and to move. And this extends down from the brain around the spinal column. And it really just kind of that membrane um, keeps the CSF or cerebrospinal fluid, CSF would be our abbreviation for that, in. And that cerebrospinal fluid does a lot of different things, but one of the things it does is it acts as a barrier to protect the spinal cord. Um, beneath the dura, there are two other membranes. These are called meninges. So let's go into that CSF a little more deeply. Um, it is clear and odorless. It's produced in the ventricles of the brain. It acts as a protecting buffer. I don't know why there's not an O in protecting, but I'll fix that eventually for the spinal cord and the brain. And it flushes toxins and waste. Um, we do spinal taps to get the CSF. And one of the things, if you remember way back in the day in diseases, we were talking about our neuromuscular patients. What did they have in their spinal column, in their sp cerebral spinal fluid that we were testing for? Think about that as we move on to the next slide. Okay, so here is a diagram from of the spine. Now remember, this is gonna be from the outside. So this would be from the outside of the back. All of the soft discs um, is gonna be up inside against the internal organs. Okay, so the, the spiny processes are just one other area of protection. So let's look at this one down from up above. So you can see the um, spinal column right in here, right? And you can see these little bit of nerves that are attaching here and they're going out and they're going on to other nerve roots and they're going to spring out and they're going to weave in and out of these spiny processes and out of these bones. And you ever hear someone say they have a pinched nerve? Well, imagine why. Look at how these things are just kind of strung through there. It kind of reminds me of this time of year, Christmas lights, trying to unstrung, um, un uh, wrap them and try to get them through things or moving around things it's really easy for things to get tangled. And it's like as these um, spiny processes, as these discs open and close, they could snap shut on those, um, those nerve roots or those little bit of nerves that are going through. And that's how people um, have problems with their um, nerves in their back. They also, you also hear about disc degeneration. That's when these intervertebral, inter, inter vertebral discs or between the vertebrae discs um, start to degenerate um, over through um, 
Sometimes people are really athletic. Sometimes it's just different disease processes will make that happen. And then it'll be bone to bone. And that will also cause pain, discomfort, and nerve problems. All right, so we do not need to know all of this stuff um, for the exam, but let me just go over it for you. Um, so these are just different spaces, the subarachnoid and the subdural space. Um, the epidural fit space actually has some fat on there. So let's just look at, if you look at this and you think about how they ship your stuff on Amazon, right? It's like they put all that, the air and all that stuff in there to protect um, your packages. That's kind of the way I think about the spinal cord. You know, look at all this protection. You know, there's, there's some fatty layers. There's this, um, this dural space. There's some fluid here, some flu more fluid here, and it's all kind of just protected, not to mention the big spiny process. If anything's coming at it, this big um, bone's going to get it first. On the inside, the big um, disc as well, the body of the vertebrae will get it first, and on both sides. And then the nerves are protected in here between the, the bones. All right, so here's the lumbar puncture. And um, if you ha haven't remembered it yet, um, when we had our neuromuscular diseases, we were looking for proteins. We were looking for proteins that were found in the cerebral spinal fluid. And those proteins were from the muscles breaking down. And that's why they had increased proteins. The other things we will look for is infection. So if we are looking for meningitis or inflammation of the meninges of the brain, um, we would find that in a lumbar puncture as well. And that would be, um, we would see it as cloudy and they would send this to the lab to find out exactly what was it was growing, whether it be a bacterial or a virus. This is how you do it. You usually do it between the third and the fourth lumbar vertebrae. You have the patient um, roll over in kind of like a, a fetal hugging your knees position to open up the vertebrae so that it makes it safer. And you go in just till you hear that pop and then they would just withdraw a little bit of fluid and that's what they would run the, for tests. All right, so let's talk about injuries. Okay, most injuries are not displaced. Displaced fractures that result in spinal cord injuries cause permanent paralysis or death. This is not the most common thing. The most common things are some of those things we've already been talking about, bulging discs, herniated discs. Sometimes that spiny process snaps right off, right? It's kind of hanging out there in the wind by itself. Um, those are gonna be your most common things that happen. Actual displaced fractures are not that common. However, because only a millimeter can compress, pinch, or shear off the spinal cord and lead to permanent paralysis, permanent meaning permanent, we really care a lot about spinal cord injuries and we err on the side of caution. So we are purposefully overreacting, even though it's only gonna be one out of 100 patients that actually has um, the displaced fracture. Okay, so let's look at this on some imaging. So and let's go back to uh, diseases here. Um, white is our fluid on an image. And in this case, gray is our tissue. So this tissue that we're looking at is the actual spinal column. And here you see that bone has pushed in and um, is squeezing the spinal column. This one over here, you can't see any fluid. Look at how there's fluid on both sides, that protectant factor. And then there's no fluid on either side and it's smushing all the way in. So there's probably at least some shearing damage, if not some permanent um, compression there. So that's why we always assume severe with an E, injury is present. 
Um, and again, like I was talking a little bit earlier, this is the time when we're going to have to use that um, jaw thrust maneuver to open our airway, and we are going to do this in the lab. Now, one thing we really want to remember is the higher the level of injury, the more paralyzed. Um, and when I say paralyzed, the what we really consider throughout this whole class, I want you to start thinking, how is this affecting me as an RT? What am I doing for the patient? And when we talk about patients at C5 or above are going to be apneic, obviously we've got to take over um, ventilation. We've got to take over ventilation. They are not going to breathe. They are not going to be able to, the brain, the pathway for the brain to say breathe down to the diaphragm has been severed. Okay, so this is both um, diaphragmatic and intercostal nerve function. So none of these um, muscles of respiration can function. So C5, you want to remember that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock results in loss of um, autoregulation or ability to maintain vascular tone. Um, when we talk about a neurogenic patient, they are um, down to like just brainstem activities at best. Um, and one of the things is that um, vascular tone. So the normal tone of the vascular kind of keeps your blood pressure from um, tanking as your um, blood, if you have no vascular tone, your, um, your vessels are gonna open wide up, your blood pressure is gonna tank, and all of your blood volume is gonna kind of go to the periphery. Not a good thing. Temperature control. Temperature is one of those things that if you can't control temperature, you know you have some sort of brain injury because that's one of the basic um, things that the brain con controls. So um, not being able to cold control temperature is a, is a big issue. And pain is not really going to tell us much because these patients, if they're paralyzed, they're going to be in no pain, however, not able to move. Um, they could have tingling, numbness, or weakness. Again, deformity is not what we're looking for. We're not looking for um, something to be obviously broken. Tenderness at any spot um, may make a suspect injury, but we're going to definitely rule it out with imaging. If they actually can't move parts of their body, that would indicate paralysis. Feeling of water flowing down the um, back or electrical shock sensation. Let's talk about this for a little bit. Um, if you think about it, the brain is sending messages and they're electrical messages, right? They're saying, okay, move, move your arms, move your legs, you know, move something, move your diaphragm. The brain's sending these electrical messages, but they're not reaching their destination because that um, spinal column has been severed. So that's why they have this feeling of electrical shock or water flowing down their back. Now let's talk about this, the triad of symptoms. Okay, so not being able to make, maintain your temperature or hypothermia is very rare, um, especially here in Phoenix, but in, in general is very rare. Only a brain injury can cause that, okay? Um, Hypotension is not really unusual for any of our ER patients. And I would say, you know, at most of our ER patients that come in with a trauma that are actually injured are going to be hypotensive. So that's going to be like when we're talking about um, differentiating these diseases, hypotension is really not going to help you here. What is going to help you is bradycardia because as the body normally compensates for hypotension, it's gonna do so trying to maintain the same cardiac output by getting tachycardic. The only time it doesn't do that is in this case where the body can't get tachycardic because the brain is trying to send a message to the heart that says go faster, go faster, but that the whole freeway is down. The, um, the cerebral um, spinal 
column um, is not working. You know, the messages cannot get through. So we have low heart rate, low temperature, and then low blood pressure. So that's our triad of symptoms. You do need to know this for neurogenic shock or um, neuro um, C-spine injuries. Okay, so C-spine injuries, um, quadriplegia will definitely re, um, be impaired breathing. Paraplegia is from fractures below the cervical level. So C5 and above, so a C2, a C3, a C4, um, for sure these patients are going to need a ventilator 24-7 for the rest of their lives. They are not going to be able to move any arms, any legs, nor the big thing that we Okay. Um, below that, C5 injury. Okay. So again, um, C1 through 4 are going to be the most severe injury. It's complete quadriplegia. They have no control of any muscles. And what do they need from us again, guys? Um, we need to intubate and put them on a mechanical ventilator, and they need to stay there forever. Okay, thoracic vertebrae. Um, T1 to 5, um, they might still be able to stand. This is because these are going towards the arms. Um, 6 to 12 is usually paraplegic, but they have good trunk control. So if they have good trunk control, what might they be able to do? Again, yes, think like an RT, breathe. They should be able to breathe. It doesn't mean that the day of their injury that they might not um, be intubated and put on a ventilator, but it means that we might be able to wean them off. You know, they might need a trach um, just to kind of um, get them through the, the winter season if they don't have the greatest cough, something like that, or they may not need anything after that initial stabilization period, okay? Lumbar and sacral injuries are, these are the least severe. Um, these guys might have some last loss of bladder control. Some patients can still walk. Um, so any of these lower injuries, these are your patients that you'll see doing like wheelchair basketball, do, being really mobile, having a, a nice quality of life in spite of their wheelchair. All right, so let's talk about what our responsibility is. Well, if you haven't guessed already, airway management. Yes, we are. We need to get these guys intubated. Before that, even we need to breathe for them. Right? They're they're not going to have the ability to breathe, especially um, the C fives or above, but maybe even some of the lower ones during their acute stage while we're stabilizing them right after their accident. Um, so we will be bag valve mass ventilating initially, and then they're not gonna start breathing spontaneously, so we'll have to put an ET tube in and put them on the ventilator to, to maintain their um, respiratory rate and um, prevent them from hypoventilating, right? Their lungs are really not having any problem, so we can probably put them on minimal settings. I know you don't know what settings are yet, but it's good to think about this. You know, their lungs aren't really injured in any way. Their brain just can't tell their diaphragm to go anymore. So they're going to be pretty easy to ventilate. It's not a big deal. They'll just be on kind of minimum safe settings. Okay. Um, C spine precautions. Um, we're going to make sure that that patient remains immobile and we're going to do a lot of this stuff in the lab, the log roll, no lateral movement. And we're going to treat for shock. Um, we might have to give some IV replacement. Remember I told you about the um, body tending to um, vasodilate so that therefore the blood pressure goes down. So we might have to do some fluid replacement for this. This is our patients. These are um, some people getting ready to log roll their patient. The person at the head of the bed is always in charge of C-spine and the, everything goes on their command. Oftentimes we are at the head of the bed. So if we had one of those T8 injuries or a, an L1 injury, we will still be in the trauma suite and we really won't have a lot to do because they're still going to be breathing. So we will be doing some of this C-spine stuff because we're going to be up at the head of the bed. Okay, 
So we don't do log rolls on the scene, um, but we do do them to evaluate them in the, in the um, hospital to evaluate um, exit wounds, injuries, things like that. Look at this happy kid here in full C-spine precautions. So we have this guy strapped completely down both sides of his head. He could not move his head if he wanted to. This is our actual C collar right in here. And we are going to leave him like that until we clear him via x-ray. All right, that is it for this lecture. There is going to be one more lecture. Um, let me go ahead and go to my computer. And I'm going to show you guys um, the course announcements and the course syllabus, just so we're understanding what you're supposed to do for this class. Okay, so under syllabus, we have our course syllabus here. Table editing, make it a little bigger. Okay, and this tells us what's going on every day. So at some point, I've probably told you, you did not have class today because you're probably watching this lecture right now on Edpuzzle, and this is this day, December 6th. When you come in on the 11th, we will have an assessment, and we will have a lab, and we will have a couple more lectures. This trauma lecture is a little bit long, so um, we probably will do the lab and the assessment at the beginning of class, and then the trauma lecture will be going a little bit longer. Um, and then every day, this one has some of the Ed puzzles on here, but these are the only the ones that are my lectures that you're not actually getting in the classroom. The other Ed puzzles will be on here still, and they are going to be your homework. So every day after class, including today, you need to open Ed Puzzle and see if there is a homework. And I'm going to open Ed Puzzle in another window in a second. Okay. So we have assessments, we have exams, we have um, the final exam, and then at the end of this class, we have ACLS. Okay, so you will have four days of ACLS. It'll be regular class time, um, eight to 12, and you will be doing ACLS at that time. Second part of this, it talks about our homework. Okay, so let's do that. Let's copy that and go. Paste and go. All right, I'll get all these pop-ups, I apologize. Okay. All right, it's telling me to go into my class because it's my class. Okay, so when you go in, it's going to have you log in to your class, and I'm going to find, and this is your class here. And there's a couple of um, Ed Puzzles that are already open, and then there's a couple that will open and close on different dates. Okay, so that means it's your responsibility to check every day after class and see if there's an Ed Puzzle, okay? These ones, um, it'll tell you the date that it's due as you go in them, okay? So this is due December 11th. So just because it's there doesn't mean you need to do it right now, but it would be a good idea to do this Anatomy of the Spinal Cord one after this lecture because it's related, okay? The trauma team one, you'd probably wanna wait till after we do the trauma lecture, okay? Um, all of these are test one um, Ed puzzles. And the purpose of the Ed puzzles is to give you more information so that you're understanding what's going on with the patient, what's going on with the lecture. And it's um, a way, for, and there's some questions on here. You may see these questions again. Um, it is your responsibility to, to do the homework. I am not going to remind you on a daily basis, hey, double check that we don't have any Ed Puzzle homework. You need to do the homework, and if you do not do the homework, you will not get credit for that homework, okay? Um, all right, let's go back into course syllabus. Let me open this. All right, and so... Um, you know, I expect you to be in attendance. I expect you to participate in classroom and in labs. Um, please, please um, email me if you have any problems, any questions. 
Another thing is um, be ready for labs any day. I need you to be in proper attire and um, I do need help in labs. Everybody's, it is my expectation that you will help if set up labs if I need to and you will help take down labs. Um, I do expect you to stay in class the whole time, not sneak out and everybody to participate, okay? So this is our grades. Um, actually, I need to change this because PPSs are gone. So I am gonna take that PPS out. And I believe I um, have another final um, presentation worksheet that um, of the um, final presentation materials. So you're responsible for turning in some materials at the final presentation. That's going to be your other 5%. Okay. And your homework, quizzes, final exam, and your final presentation. And we'll go over that into detail. Okay. Close that. Save. All right, let's go into the classroom and show you how it's organized. Okay, so each of these is a folder. Exam one material. You will see the different um, lectures. Each day is two lectures. I have them the same color. So spinal cord and flight are both orange. So those are both day one lectures. Um, trauma and BLS would be day two lectures. And then these are just extra um, material that you have here. These are not um, additional lectures because there's only the four lectures. Then we go into exam one. Let's go back to course content and see what else we can find. Quizzes and exams, everything is in Blackboard. So assessment number one, when it's time to take it, you will just click here and it will appear that day. Um, there are three exams and a final. Okay, and those will all be taken um, in the computer lab. Um, there, once we finish the exam one material, we'll move on to exam two material, just more PowerPoints, just different subjects. And again, they're kind of lined up. ACLS at the end of this class that has material in here. And let me go to the Grade Center. Okay, so there are no grades in this class yet, so we can safely look at the Grade Center. So um, these are all the things that you will be graded on. You have a final project, that presentation handout. That's what I was trying to write right now in the, in the um, syllabus. Homework, lab, final exam, exam three, exam two, exam one. Um, we have these are assessments one through four, and then this is a stimulation, post-stimulation um, assessments. When we go back to the calendar right now, I'll show you what we're talking about when we're doing our simulation. Let's go back here. So we have a lot of labs in this class. We have our C-spine um, lab on the 10th. On, uh, I don't know, this is August, sorry. There it is. We have our C-spine lab here when we come back on December 11th. On December um, 12th, we are gonna have an exam. And then this is gonna be, I'm gonna have you look at those um, lectures on your own. On the 13th, we have RSI lecture and a really fun RSI lab. This day, we're gonna be all, all in the classroom. This day we'll kind of be mostly in the classroom, probably get some stimulant, some, um, we might get some time with Bob, listening to breast sounds, going over some asthma um, scenarios. And on the seventh, we have a long simulation lab. And what that's gonna be is that's gonna be all of the students are gonna rotate in groups of two to three at the most. And you're gonna go in and you're gonna assess the patient, our simulation mannequin. And you're going to go in there and you're going to make decisions on how to treat him and you're going to do it. It's all live action. Um, you're going to look at the vitals on the monitor. You're going to assess the breast sounds in front of you and fix the patient based on that. 
um, and do this all in, in real world time. So that's a, a really fun one that everybody really enjoys. So we have this rapid response team um, lecture we'll do real quick and then um, have an assessment then we'll get down to the lab for that one. Here we're doing exam three. We have peds emergency and shock. On the 11th assessment four, we have a couple, um, an, an EKG lecture, we have some, pre and then our presentations. Um, the presentations are gonna be really important in this class because notice we go to December 20th and then we come back and um, after two weeks of break and we're starting right back up. So what the presentations are, are um, they are kind of um, shortened, cliff notesy, um, little um, snippets of these lectures. There are a lot of lectures in this class. And so everyone is going to be assigned one lecture and you're going to shorten it way down into a handout, a single page handout, single sided, and five minutes or less of FYI, remember. Okay, so we're gonna, you're gonna shrink my 30, 45 minute lectures down to five minutes and a single page. And that's gonna be in order for us to um, study for our final exam, because the final exam will be cumulative on all subjects from the very beginning of this class. Okay, all right, so let me close that, close that. Um, I think that should be it, guys. Um, you should be able to navigate through here. I will get the second video up shortly. And have a great day.